Good morning. Welcome to our first Sunday of the summer worship. Nice to have you all here. Not quite as many who braved the wind last week, so apparently you'd rather be here for the wind than to be here on a summer Sunday morning. For the people who aren't here, you know who you are. Anyway, good to have you here. No wind to disrupt us this week, and that's wonderful. Um, Thumbs up from my Zoom folks. Do I see a thumbs up? Yep, okay, they're good. So we're back in gear there. Thank you, Dave. What kind of announcements do we have to share here on the first Sunday of the summer? Anything in this area right here that has anyone moved and stirred? Dave, you got something? No? Well, next Saturday, not this coming Saturday, but the next one is a steak sandwich sale. So if anybody can help, come on out. You got it. Two Saturdays from now, a steak sandwich sale. Linda, I believe you probably have an announcement. Our beautiful flowers this morning are presented by Ed and Fern Engel, and it is an honor to celebrate their 32nd anniversary. All right, 32nd. Does she have it right? 32? Happy anniversary, Ed and Fern. Wonderful. Very good. Very, very good. Good job. Anything else there? Okay, let me uh, give you a few other things. So uh, we do have, again, I announced this two weeks ago, we have announcement sheets that we made a few for some of you who would like to take them with you because you might miss what's up on the screen while you're sitting here or are prone as I am to forget what I say or what we talk about. So you got to remind yourself throughout the week. So there are sheets right on the little table right around the door here as you go out. So feel free to pick those up. Also, uh, I believe on the table in the um, Narthex, you will find on, on this side of the Narthex, you'll find printed directories. We've just updated our directories with addresses and phone numbers and names and all that again. We're trying to do that on a yearly basis. So if you would like a, a paper copy of that, I believe they're, they're out there and there should be enough for us today. If you wanna probably at this point, just take one per household would be helpful, but we will also have it available with an email or you can go on to our website and have access to it. Um, that requires a code, I think, and I, that I gotta find out about because we don't want the world having all of our addresses. But if you wanna go to the website and look up somebody's address, there's a code to get into that, but there's a couple ways. But for now, there are paper copies, so feel free to take one. I did have an email out this week about, hmm, well now, that's a problem. The key, oh, here they are, the key cards. If any of you have a key card that you were issued over the years that you're no longer really using because you're not a part of a committee anymore or anything else that needs you to get in here at an odd hour, if you have these and are willing to kind of relinquish it back to the office, that would be great because we're running out of them. We need to make new ones, particularly for new staff and, and folks like that. And over the years, some of these have been misplaced, lost, or never returned. But if you can and you don't need it anymore, just bring it back to the office. That would be appreciated. We can recycle them and reissue them and don't have to go out and buy a whole new pack. And I think you have to buy like 100 and they're kind of pricey. So. If you have one, please bring it back to us if you're not using it. Um, Bobby Snyder. We uh, are somewhere yeah. along the line, I think I sent an email, so just ongoing, feel free to, when you're at the grocery store, pick up an extra pack of uh, or bundle of paper towels. We're trying to uh, keep the paper towel flow uh, flow going over at Effort Area Social Service, because that's something that they constantly are in need of. So um, if you would like to drop those off sometime, you can just put them out here at the North Decks and we will make sure they get there. That would be appreciated. Another thing that we're looking for is uh, we have a, a, a wonderful group of like four or five individuals that uh, graciously and willingly help to mow our facility lawn here. Uh, we have a tractor here to do that. We have the equipment. Um, but we would like to get a few more people who might have an interest in that. The more, the better. 
Do you want um, to currently, like I said, there's four or five. They're able to oh, each one to alternate. So it's once a month, typically, that you would be mowing. Uh, it might be less than that if there's more of you. So if you would have any interest or would like to know more about that, talk to him. Don't talk to me. Talk to him. Uh, Dave would, would be glad to help you out with that, and we will be glad to have uh, more help with, with that uh, project here. Um, Sunday, July the 10th. We've got a couple weeks to go, but Sunday, July the 10th, from 6.30 to 7.30 in the evening, we would like our Christian education team is going to be providing a uh, children's fun evening for Lila and anybody Lila brings with her or our care center children bring with her or our church children. Uh, it's going to be our own little makeshift Bible school, same kind of concept. They'll have some crafts, some games, some food, some singing, a message um, in the course of an hour's time. And we're going to do that on July the 10th and again in August. But I'm making you aware, first of all, if you know any children in your life and your family that might enjoy that, but also if you might like to come out and help us out. We might, uh, we're might. we hoping to get a, a small crowd of children and it might require a few extra hands to help move them from spot to spot and, and things. So keep that in mind for July the 10th. <clears throat> and the last thing I'll say is following today's service, I'm going to be taking off on vacation until Tuesday, July the 5th. So next Sunday, we will have a guest preacher and Matt and Trinell will be leading the service. Um, and uh, throughout the week or leading up to July 5th, if you have any, any needs pastorally, give Matt a call, uh, Matt or Trinell, uh, and they will, uh, they know kind of what to do and uh, we'll go from there. So if you have anything, please be in touch with them. Uh, and I will have minimal access to however they say it. Minimal access to my phone and email. Yeah, right. But whatever. Uh, I will see you again after July the 5th. All right. Here we are. Worshiping in the beauty of God's presence, for we know he is here. Just look around. Last week we were outside and we could look around and see God's presence. We could hear the wind. Today we look around and we see God's presence, not in this building, but in the eyes and the hands and the bodies of those sitting right around you. The very presence of God in the body of Christ. He is here. We have come to worship him. Let our worship be lifted on high. Let's pray. God, we do come. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our ears, everything, to know that we are not here on our own, but we are here in your powerful, wonderful presence. Receive our worship and help us to receive what we need from you today, whether we know it or not, realizing that we are here because you moved and stirred us. So we come. You are to be praised, for you are Lord, our Almighty. Amen. So would you please rise and let's join together in our first hymn this morning. It's going to be hymn number uh, 112, You Servants of God.
We have a most powerful, wonderful, almighty God, and we get to be his children and his servants, the ones who he delegates to take care of his creation, take care of his world, look after each other, and be the people of Christ in this world. We take on that call. We commit ourselves to it. But at times that commitment fails. At times we let other things call our attention. At times we want to serve something else, or even more so, we want to be the one served. So God invites us to come to him on occasions like this and remember who he is, who we are, humbling ourselves with confession. So let's take a moment, the silence of our heart, to confess to God our lack at times of commitment, our breaking of that commitment to God, our disobedience, our desire to be God in our own lives. Let's pray. In your presence this morning, O oh Lord, from our humble hearts, we confess our sinfulness before you. We acknowledge that you are God and we are your beloved children, your called servants, entrusted to be stewards, entrusted to be partners with you entrusted with your image, entrusted with the spirit that you grant us. Forgive us for all the ways in which we, in our own way, consciously and mostly unconsciously, have relinquished those roles, those identities, now you're gonna have trouble getting in favor of something that's so inferior. You are God. To you we come, grateful that you are God who does not hold things over us or against us, but has covered a multitude of our sin. The work of Jesus Christ. In his name we come, to your grace we turn. Amen. Be assured that you are the beloved of God. Through him and Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness and it has been granted and assured. Receive what God has promised. Receive the commitment God has to you of a love from which nothing can separate you. Thanks be to God. Amen. God's commitment is such that we can have peace. So remind each other of that peace for a moment. Turn to those around you, share on Zoom, the peace of Christ be with you all. Christ be with you all. Do we can run. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you all. You may be seated. I'm going to invite Lila on up here. And Virginia, would you like to come up and sit with me? We have Virginia along here today. Have a seat right there. You weren't expecting to come right up here in the front, were you? Well, that's how we do things around here. Virginia, you win the prize for having come the farthest. Your name's Virginia, but can you tell everybody, do you know what state you're from? Can you tell them what state you live in? Charleston, South Carolina. Wow, pretty impressive. But thanks for being with us today. And Lila, you didn't drive as far. No, but that's okay. About four minutes, okay. Well, nice to have you take the four minutes to come here. Now, ladies, question for you. Have you ever made a promise to anyone? Lila, Virginia, 
What kind of promise did you make, Lila? You remember? I'm sure you've made several, but do you remember a promise that you made? No? Okay. You neither, but you know you made a promise, haven't you? On paper, okay. So we promise to do things for people, maybe. Maybe mom and dad to say, hey, I need you to take out the trash. And you are sitting, playing a game or watching TV, and you say, I will. And that's kind of a promise. You make a promise to do your homework at school. You promise your teacher. You may not say that word, but when you take the homework and say, I'll do it, that's a promise. Like a pinky promise, exactly. There's two kinds, tell me. Exactly, so there's a, so, oh, Lila, you open up a can of words. So there's a promise that comes out of your mouth and a pinky promise to do something like that. Now you're not telling me, Lila, that sometimes the one that comes out of your mouth doesn't get done, but the one with the pinky promise, that'll get done. Good answer. Good answer. But you know what? We all have to admit, we don't always meet our promises. Sometimes we break promises. And people have made promises to you, and they will make promises to you, from friends to family to anyone, can say, we'll do this for you, or we'll do that for you, or we're gonna do this, and then it doesn't happen. Okay. I will promise to get shoes for you. Well, somebody got your shoes, you have shoes, there you go. There you go. So she promised to get shoes for you, and she got the promise. But sometimes people might promise something, and they don't fulfill it, because we come up with excuses to not meet our promises. But here's the thing, God has made a promise to you to love you no matter what. And do you think God ever breaks that promise? God does not break that promise. We sometimes break promises, even to God. We tell God we love him, but then we go do things that God wouldn't like us to do. So that's kind of breaking the promise. So God is saddened by that, but the thing to remember is he's going to still love us. Now. That doesn't mean we keep breaking a promise all the time, right? No, but remember, he loves you so that you can keep having strength to fulfill the promises that you make to God and to each other. So, remember the promises you make. Fulfill the promises you make. Do them. Don't break them, because that hurts people's feelings a lot of times, okay? Especially when you fulfill a promise to God. He loves you and he wants you to love him too, okay? All right, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you have promised us your love and you have never failed because Jesus is always there. Let us always remember that and give us strength to do the things that we say we're going to do for our parents, for our friends, for each other, for our brothers or sisters, for whoever's in our life, when we promise, let's be faithful. Most importantly, our promises to you to love you and to love others as you call us to. I thank you for Virginia and Lila being with us today. May they enjoy your love always. Amen. All right, so Miss Becky, you get Miss Becky today, and she's going to talk more to you about, I think, promises and commitment and all that. So have a good time. And we are going to let God continue to speak to us from voices to music. So, folk sharing with us today, and let God use this to enhance our time together.
as our hearts continue in a meditative mood, we turn to God's word and invite Howard up as he shares with us our readings for the day. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. The Old Testament reading comes from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, verse 19. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were 12 yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my mother and my father, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Gospel reading is found in Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for his arrival. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. So yes, some of those passages or verses remind me of bacon and eggs. So that should make you all kind of hungry. You all know, I'm sure, the, the story of the chicken and the pig who decide they're going to do something nice for their farmer. They're going to get him a breakfast. The chicken kind of came up with the idea, and the chicken said, I think both of us could make a nice breakfast for the farmer. And, uh, you know, the chicken said we could make some bacon and eggs. The pig thought about this for a little while, and the pig finally said, well, that's easy for you to say. You're going to make a contribution, but I'm going to make a commitment. Now, why I thought of that is that as I, you know, hear that gospel reading, and, and we'll talk a little bit about Elisha, too, in a bit, but as I hear those, that's the word that kind of comes to my mind. In the midst of John and James talking about casting down fire on this village that didn't receive Jesus, to these wannabe disciples who kind of come up with their excuses, to Jesus giving this 
calling, this issuing to the 70 or the 72 uh, disciples to go out and to spread his word. In the midst of all that and between all those things, there is a recurring theme in my mind, and that's the theme of commitment. The commitment of, of John and James to their to, to, to their movement, to what they're doing, to the point that in a, in a you know, not a very healthy way, an overdone way, potentially dangerous way, they were going to have fire sent down on these people who are resisting that movement. They're committed to it. And the wannabe disciples who are challenged by the notion of commitment to the point that they, they find ways to excuse themselves. And then to Jesus issuing a commitment, no sandals, no purse, no bag, don't talk to anybody. It's, it's this idea of committing themselves to doing what Jesus says to do. Commitment's a, a significant theme in our faith. In fact, I think it's fundamental to everything. And, and for me personally, it's always been a pretty strong uh, theme throughout my sense of ministry and my own sense of calling. When I was a uh, very, I think I was still in college, I might have even been in high school when I was given an opportunity to preach at my home church. And I remember one time preaching a sermon where what we ended up doing was we had a recommitment Sunday. That's what we called it, recommitment Sunday, where I invited everybody who had their name in the church membership book to come forward after the sermon and rewrite their name in there. Because many people had been members for a long, long time. Many of them had not been committed, had not really attended worship and not participated for a long time. And we tried to get people to come on out to this service who hadn't been there for a long time to try and recommit themselves, not just to the church, but to Christ. And that was, I thought, a very important thing for us always to be mindful, of. always to be mindful of the theme of commitment. There's lots of definitions of commitment. One that I'm going to use today basically is the state of being obligated or emotionally impelled. Obligated and emotionally impelled. In other words, we're going to obligate ourselves to something. It's a duty. It's a commitment. We're going to do it. One pastor, John Maxwell, said it's, it's another word for commitment is staying power, staying in it, hanging in there, sticking with it. Another author I like, Marva Dawn, she calls commitment the, the hilarity of commitment. She says it's just a, a, a hilarious thing in comparison to our society. It's something that seems foolish in our world today, commitment, even more so than when she wrote that probably 40 years ago. Has our society kind of been less and less about commitment and more and more about the spontaneous and what can we do now and, and changing our plans? Commitment is crucial to our faith. There's lots of historic, dramatic stories of commitment that I find fascinating. You might remember the story of Hernando Cortez. You remember Cortez. He's the guy who discovered South America. So Cortez, supposedly the story goes that on February 19th, 1519, he uh, set sail for Mexico, he and an entourage. And in his entourage, there were 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, and 553 soldiers. The population they were coming to at the time was approximately 5 million people. So the odds were kind of against them. Mathematically, it was 7,541 to one for their survival. And everyone who had tried to explore that area prior to them, no one had been able to do so. No colony had been established in Mexico and South America, Central America, prior to Cortez getting there. But you know what Cortez did when he got there? He succeeded, but what helped him succeed? Burn the ships. When they arrived, he commanded, that his crew burned all the ships. There's no going back. We're here and we're going to conquer this land. There's also the story of the one-way missionaries. Not sure if you've ever heard of these folks, but back in the turn of the 19th and 20th century, there were people who went into the mission field, particularly the places that no one had ever gone to before, 
And they went there and they were called one-way missionaries because they would get a one-way ship ticket to wherever they were going. And their luggage was a coffin because they were not coming back. What meager belongings they had, they stowed in a coffin. They went to where they thought they were going to be, where God called them, and they did the work they were called to, most of them, in areas that were going to be aggressive and eventually probably kill them. That's commitment. That's commitment. Burn the ships. One-way missionaries. It's bedrock to our faith. It's what constitutes a disciple of anything or anyone. A disciple is someone with commitment, specifically with Jesus. Eugene uh, Peterson, who was the person who did the translation, the message, which if you have been reading the three translations of the gospel reading each week that I sent out, or if you take the paper and read those, the third one is always from the message, which is a very a very loose paraphrase of the Bible, put in extremely contemporary language. But when he, Eugene Peterson, translated verse 1 of chapter 5, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he translates it this way. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed the hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. The disciples, in Peterson's mind, are the committed. Jesus himself is commitment personified. He is God's gift of commitment to us. I will say this, please don't take it wrong. Let's just go back to the beginning picture and the whole story of the pig and the chicken. And let's just say this, Jesus is the pig in the story. He's not just laying an egg for us. He's given a life for us. He is commitment personified. And there's the rub for the church, as I see it over the years. The church is the committed. The church is the faithful to Jesus Christ and to his ways of incarnational love, of sacrificial love. However, rather than being people of commitment, rather than being people who have been uh, who have allowed ourselves to be given up, we instead have settled for being contributors and participants. Again, to the pig and the chicken story, you can add the cow. He could also provide some milk for breakfast. He's going to contribute as well. But the cow is not committed. In the church, we have a lot of participants. We have a lot of contributors. But sometimes we forget that Jesus called us to be disciples, which are people who are committed, invested. One of my favorite stories, and I'm sure at some point I've had to have shared this before, but Clarence Jordan was a gentleman back in the 60s. He was a farmer. He was a New Testament scholar. He was a founder of a group called the Koinonia Farm which I believe was in Georgia. And it was a, a religious community, a Christian community, like a commune, but just a community of people, which in 19, the mid-1960s was interracial in Georgia. So Clarence Jordan faced all sorts of threats from people, though he had become extremely popular. He also, like uh, Eugene Peterson, who did the message, Back in the 60s, Clarence Jordan wrote the Cotton Patch Bible, which was, again, just a reinterpretation of Scripture. He took a lot of heat, a lot of death threats, a lot of bomb scares on his community, a lot of fires set. He had a brother. His brother's name was Bob. Bob Jordan, who at the time of this story was one of the state lawmakers of Georgia, eventually became one of the Supreme Court uh, justices of Georgia. 
when Clarence Jordan was in the midst of receiving all these threats and all this in, imposition from the community and from the legislators toward what he was doing on his farm, trying to create this community of interracial folks and desegregation, he went to his brother and said, is there some help you can give me legally? And his brother basically declined the offer. And the interchange between them went something like this. Robert said, Clarence, you know I can't do that. You know I'm going into politics. If I represented you, I'd lose everything. It's different for you. Clarence said, why is it different for me? You and I were baptized on the same Sunday when we were boys. The preacher asked us both the same question. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I said, yes. What did you say, Robert? Robert said, Clarence, I follow Jesus up to a point. I follow him to the cross, but not on the cross. I'm not going to get crucified. Clarence replied to his brother's comments with, then I don't believe you're a disciple. You're an admirer of Jesus, but not a disciple. God help us if we are only admirers of Jesus. We have a lot of admiration for Jesus. We have a lot of admirers. We have a lot of contributors. We have a lot of participants, but commitment, a willingness to give of ourselves entirely, a willingness to do what Elisha did in essence. Elisha is a great story. Here's Elijah, who's about to be taken up by God. Elijah's been this amazing prophet. And God says, I want you to now pass your mantle. In other words, I want you to, to give your powers onto this Elisha, young man. So Elijah arrives, finds Elisha out, tending his field with oxen, with his, with his uh, you know, makeshift tractor, if you will finds all that, and he comes to Elisha, and he gives him his mantle. Elisha knows that means he is being called into God's service. And Elisha makes the same comment that one of the would-be followers of Jesus makes. He says, let me first go back to my family and kiss them goodbye. And Elijah says, go right ahead. What's that to me? Which is basically interpreted as, hey, I'm here ready to go now. You can go back there, go right ahead. If you need to turn around, go, go, go ahead, but I'm moving on. To which we get the sense that Elisha understood that. And what do we say? What do we hear Elisha does? He, it says, returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered the oxen, used the equipment from the oxen. He boiled their flesh, gave it to all the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. What did he do? He took the only possessions he had, oxen and the, you know, the yoke and the, and, the, and the sled. He destroyed them to give to the people so there's nothing left but to follow God. He was, as I like to say, all in. When we talk about commitment, we're talking about being all in. Just like the one-way missionaries, all in. Just like Cortez, we are all in. And that's difficult because we all have so much to hold on to. We don't want to give up our oxen. We don't want to burn up our, our plow. We don't want to burn our ships just in case. We're not sure. We forget, however, that when we were baptized, more so probably most of us here when we were confirmed, there's a degree to which we made statements, just like Charles here. Well, Charles, when I baptize you, everything that goes under belongs to God. There you go. There are things we don't want to give to God. There are things we don't want to let go of. There are things that we're going to hold on to and we might contribute, but we're not sure we're going to commit it. We're the rich young rulers when Jesus, who approached Jesus and said, look, I want eternal life. I want in. And Jesus said, okay, you can be in. Did you follow the commandments? Yes, I followed everything. And then Jesus said, there's one thing. You have a lot of stuff. I want you to get rid of it all and give it to the poor and then come follow me. That was the rich young ruler. He couldn't do it. He couldn't commit. Commitment is about being all in. And 
It's about going all out, giving it your all, going all out into it. There are people who, who live their life as a cop out. In other words, they, they don't have any goals, they don't have any decisions, and they don't do anything. They don't go anywhere. There are people who are, all of a sudden, I've lost it now. Kevin, can you help me? Let's see. Okay, there are people who are holdouts. They're uncertain, so they don't go. They hold out. There are people who are, go ahead, Kevin, dropouts. They start to go, but they quit. And then finally, there are the people who are all outs. They do have goals. They do pay a price. They do reach those goals. They make it. They are all in and they go all out. I'm reminded of, there we go, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. Not sure if you know this. Michelangelo developed, they believe, some people believe he became blind. Other pieces of history say he just began to have a, a sight impairment issues. But what they're pretty certain that it was the result of was him laying flat on a scaffold, very close to the ceiling, having what they, what they term uh, spatial perception that was like this most of his day, and then painting with paint that was dripping down into his eyes. After so long of doing that, as you all know, it took a long time to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo was blind or definitely had some sight impairments because he went all in and he went all out. He gave it his all to that point. Commitment involves a, a no turning back. Just as Jesus said when the, when the one guy said, I want to go back and say goodbye to my family, Jesus said, you know, you can't put your hand to the plow and turn back and still think you're going to get something done. Elisha, you know, same thing. He says, let me go back. And Elijah kind of in his own subtle, passive, aggressive way says, I'll go right ahead, but I'm, I'm moving on. I'll go somewhere else. Because the same idea is he can't, he can't go back. I remember when I first had my very first travel on a plane. I'm not a big flight guy. But when I was 18, my first flight was out of Harrisburg and to Chicago and then off to San Jose. I went to the West Coast. And I remember being on a plane on the runway. There was a young woman sitting next to me I kind of was chatting with. And as we started to take off, I looked at her and I said, no turning back now. And there wasn't. I was committed. I wasn't getting out now. Commitment involves no turning back. Commitment is costly. It is a costly matter. We have to ask these commitment questions of our lives, of our faith, of our relationship with God. What is wanted or needed of me in this relationship, in this calling from God into faithfulness. What's needed and wanted of me? What will it cost? You know, how much, how much ham and bacon do I need to give of myself? Am I willing to pay that price? And when should I start paying the price if I am? Those are commitment questions because there is a cost when it comes to commitment. Robert Putnam, who wrote this big, thick book called American Grace, which was all this research and all these studies on, on American uh, religion, he share, shared this little story of, um, of a conversation that involved a woman who was preparing for baptism. And she had a friend that she was talking to about it. And the friend said, she knew about this church, and she said, this is a hard church to be a member of. There's a lot expected of you. And the woman who was to be baptized responded, well, it should be. If it's real to you, then it's going to be hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. It's not easy to commit because there is a cost involved. Our commitment oftentimes is most revealed through our priorities. 
Our priorities are going to show where our heart is, where our commitment is. It's kind of the, the pinky swear, as Lila was saying. The one that you say you're really going to do. When I was a freshman in college, our second semester, during our Christmas break, we had a young man on our floor. He was a sophomore. And he went home at Christmas and he didn't come back. He came back to visit once, but he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. It was about halfway through the semester that we learned he had committed suicide. And that devastated our floor, devastated these young people in school, didn't know what to make of that. And, and our head resident invited us to get together as a floor of students, of men, and have a, a kind of a prayer group and an accountability group to, to help each other, to talk together. Because obviously something was going on with this young guy and he didn't have anybody to talk to perhaps. So we did this. And the expectation, the commitment was every Monday evening for two hours, we were going to get together. That was a commitment. Every Monday evening. And this went on for about three weeks. And then the fourth week, Monday night, was the, uh, if I get myself straight here, was the big NCAA tournament basketball championship between North Carolina State and Jimmy Valvano and Houston, or somebody. And I wanted to watch that game, as did many of the other guys. But the person who led our group is like, we've got to keep this commitment. We've got to be there for each other. Not everybody's going to go watch the game. Some guys here need each other. We need to be together. And I remember going through that, just wanting to come up with excuses and excuses. And one of my best friends, he was part of this group, but he says, I'm, I'm going to watch a game. But I went to the group. Went to the group. All along, being aware there's a basketball a game I like to watch going on. But here I am. I was committed. Sadly, halfway through the meeting, we heard the screams of a whole host of people watching this game because the game was won in a very dramatic fashion, and I missed it. But I kept the commitment as part of my own faith, as part of my own sense of calling from God to be the love of Christ for one another. Jesus has these encounters with these wannabe disciples who come up with these excuses to not follow him. And Jesus has some fairly stern responses. You know, foxes have somewhere to lay their head, but the Son of Man, if you're going to follow me, you may not have anywhere to lay your head. Let You go let the dead bury the dead. Hey, if you want to go to your parents and kiss them, fine, but you can't follow and turn back at the same time. These are harsh things for Jesus to say, and maybe we like to say he couldn't have said that. It's just Jesus. He couldn't have been that difficult. But listen, we talk a lot. I talk a lot. We talk a lot. The church talks a lot. Jesus talks a lot about love. You do not have love without commitment. That isn't love if there's no commitment. It might be affection. It might be two people who like each other or people who like each other. But it's not love. I tell couples before they get married, if you think you're in love, that's what our society says, you wouldn't come to me and say you're going to get married, you wouldn't have a date and all that kind of stuff, you wouldn't put all this money into it if you didn't love each other, but I tell them, you really don't. You like each other. You found each other to be good companions. You have affection for each other, you're attracted to each other. But love isn't something that really happens until you stand before God and each other and say, I'm all in. I'm all out, I'm giving up, going all out for this. I'm not turning back. I'm willing to pay the price, not just the price of, of a reception or of a ring or whatever. I'm paying the price that's going to happen here. This is my priority. That's what happens when you finally are married. Love starts because a commitment has been made. So if as a church we're going to talk about love, we can't do it without commitment. And so Jesus was going to be tough on that. As do we need to be with each other. Committing ourselves to Jesus. 
to following him, being his disciples, being willing to be the ones who are going to give the ham and the bacon to this, not just lay an egg every once in a while, but give of ourselves to Christ, to his calling and work of love, to his body, the church, and the service he's called us to. Let us pray. Holy God, we consider this today not just because it sounds right and it sounds good, but because, again, it is the basis of our relationship with you. You have fully committed yourself as God to us in the love shown in Jesus Christ. You have been all in and are going all out and you're not backing away and you haven't backed away. Even in our sinfulness, you've extended grace. You have paid the ultimate price in Jesus Christ. And you have called us again, as we said earlier, we have called us your children, your beloved, made us your servants in your work. You've made us your priority of all creation. So as your children and as your servants and as the body of Christ, may we begin to take more seriously who we are, the promises we have made to you, the faithfulness we desire to have in you, and the commitment that our baptism, our confirmation, our church membership all implies. Move us from participating. Move us from contributing into being committed. We give the ministry of this church, the ministries that we support, the ministries of our brothers and sisters in Christ all around us in their churches and in their organizations. We give it to you, Lord, that you might bless us, that we can continue to be a a real presence, a faithful presence, a committed presence in our community. Through the thick and thin of whatever new issue comes along, whatever new situation tries to polarize and, and push us apart, may we be the people that say, there is love. We are standing with you, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been. We're here. We are with you for you have been with us. Give us the strength to do that personally, as a church. Bless the gifts of tithes and offerings that have been given today, that are on our altar this morning. Bless them that they indeed might be used by you through us, through the ministries we support, to declare the unending love that you have for us to declare the indestructible light that you shine through us. We thank you that we can come to worship you together today, O oh Lord. Receive us as we go. Receive our prayers and our worship and speak to our hearts. And we ask this all in the precious name of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven. as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's close with, I think, a very appropriate hymn of consecration and commitment. Let's rise and sing together, O Jesus, I have promised.
follow and serve. Grace has been given you in Jesus Christ our Lord. Follow and serve. Keep the promise. Be the promise as you commit to go. Amen. You may be seated.